Hi, and welcome to the channel. If you've been here before, welcome back. If it's your first time, stick around because today we're talking multiple sclerosis. So today we're going to be talking about uh, multiple sclerosis and how it affects me um, where, as you can see, if you've seen any of my other videos, we're back down Rocker Beach, which is one of my favourite places. Bracken's been out, had a bit run along the sand, Alison's pottering about, just <laughs> sitting there picking bits of uh, shells and stones and sea glass and bits and pieces. Um, so we're now just sitting in the van and I wanted to discuss multiple sclerosis. Um, we may get a couple of little interruptions. As I say, I've got Brackenbury's head hanging out of the door, um, which I'll, there he is. He's got his head popped out the door. Here's uh, a, couple of, a couple of kids just turned up right next to us there, but as I say, we'll crack on a little bit. Um, So I'm just going to handhold this, I think. Might just be a bit easier with things going on. Um, so multiple sclerosis. Um, <clears throat> when was I first diagnosed? Um, obviously, if you've been following the channel, you'll know that I actually have uh, chronic myeloid leukemia and uh, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, I also have cervical stenosis, so a bit of a triple whammy on all of them. Um, I did do a video earlier about um, the chronic myeloid leukemia and how I was diagnosed and things like that. Obviously this one, we're trying to concentrate a little bit on multiple sclerosis, although the journey actually crisscrosses uh, along the way. So how did it actually come about with me? So personally what happened is I was diagnosed with um, chronic myeloid leukemia in 2017. During that time I was on a drug called imatinib. Uh, I've now since changed to a different drug, but the imatinib I was getting quite a few side effects with the cramps and things like that. But after a lot of research myself on Google, it transpires that whilst taking imatinib, it is also possible for your phosphate levels to drop. Now, what had actually happened was, I went to the GP because I was having um, numbness in my lower right leg, sort of from the knee down. Um, it was numb. Um, I was, when I was going to bed on a night, it was, um, like I was getting like a burning sensation um, which was really strange because me, me leg and my foot actually felt really cold to me in my sense to, to physically touch it it was fine it was normal so I, I just had that sensation that it was permanently freezing cold and numb but the minute I got into bed with the covers over it felt like it was on fire constantly just on fire to the point where I would always sleep with my leg completely out of the bed. Um, even when it was cold in the bedroom and things like that, it, it just felt like it was on fire. So anyway, I went to the doctors, um, explained all of this. Um, the doctor had a bit look and checked it and stuff out like and right, okay, I'm not sure what we're going to do with that. Um, we'll just keep an eye on it in the coming months. Anyway. Skip forward, you know, a couple of years basically before anything was actually really investigated. My foot, uh, my leg was getting worse. It felt more numb. It was mainly from the knee down. Um, on top of all of this, I was actually having a leg swelling, um, which I now know came from one of the medications that I take for something else. Um, so I was getting water retention in my legs as well. 
uh, mainly in my right leg was the worst that was affected. Um, I knew from the onset that my lower leg, my lower right leg was swelling. It wasn't causing me any problems, but when I was wearing um, jeans or to my trousers for work and things like that, I would feel that leg was tighter. Um, which was strange. I, I went to the doctors, I explained this, it's swelling. She would measure one leg against the other and say it's the same. Right, well, obviously both legs must be swelling because, you know, it's not like I'm wearing a, a cheap pair of, well, there were cheap jeans, but, you know, it wasn't that one leg was tighter than the other. It was the leg was swelling. Um, anyway, this went on and on for two, ended up three years. Quickly coming back to the umatinib and phosphate levels dropping. When I was checking, um, if your phosphate levels plummet, this can lead to um, neuropathy. So um, peripheral neuropathy, which was on the outside of my leg, and this is where I was thinking, is this the link to the problem I've got with my leg? Anyway, I went and got around testo and everything else, and. Sure enough, um, my phosphate levels had plummeted. Uh, I can't remember if it was photophosphemia, it's called, or hyperphosphemia, I can't remember which one it was. But my phosphate levels had plummeted to a dangerous point. Now, this actually came about one morning when I'd getting up. Um, I'd had a good night's sleep, came downstairs, sitting in the chair, within five minutes I was falling asleep. Could not keep my eyes open. Um, Alison came in, she was like, what's the matter with you? And I went, I just, I'm drained, I kind of keep my eyes open. Now, obviously you get fatigued with, um, with CML and with MS, you get fatigued all the time, but it wasn't fatigue, it was this, obviously I know what the fatigue is, but this wasn't fatigue. This was just, I could not physically keep my eyes open, I just needed to sleep. So Alison was worried about this, I made an appointment at the GP, so I went back to the GP, explained that, she'd done the tests, it came back that my phos uh, phosphates had plummeted to a dangerous level, and this is why I was feeling sleepy. Um, I was literally slipping into uh, unconsciousness. Anyway, GP prescribed, um, I can't remember what it was, but it was something to get my phosphate levels up quickly Hello. over like, the course of a few days. Um, we done that, that worked, tightness went away, but I still had the problem with the leg. So now rolling on three years, um, they were starting to investigate a little bit more, so I got an appointment with a um, neurologist. Um, so I went to see the neurologist. She had done a couple of quick tests and stuff like that, and they went, right, yeah, I think this is more than something that's just neuropathy. Um, we need to investigate it more, so we're going to send you for an MRI scan. So, went for the MRI scan. I, I, I honestly can't remember years, time scales, or things like that, because my memory is just shot, um, struggling to remember anything. But went for the, the MRI scan. Um, that came back. I then went to see the neurologist again. Um, and the neurologist said, right, looking at your scan, we can see you have um, lesions and scar tissue on your spinal cord. Right, okay. Um, but the lesions look um, like older lesions, I think is what they actually said. Um, anyway, they determined that, right, we think this is uh, multiple sclerosis. Um, we need to do a, a lumbar puncture to double check, you know, get the fluids for that. So I was then booked in for a lumbar puncture um, a month or so later. It wasn't, there wasn't much of a gap. Anyway, I got the, the lumbar puncture. <coughs> um, just if anybody's not had a lumbar puncture, I was, you know, you hear horror stories, it hurts, it, so much pain, you get everything and whatever. Anyway, for me, it was fine. Uh, went into uh, the hospital, just went into a bit of a side room. I got my lumbar puncture in the sitting position. I believe you can get the sitting or a lying down position where they pull you into like a, like a fetal position to, to do it. I was in a sitting position on the side of the bed, leaning really far forward over a, a pillow, basically. 
Um, and the guy came in and done the lumbar puncture, not a bit of bother, no pain whatsoever. Um, yes, it, it was uncomfortable, but it wasn't painful, just a little bit uncomfortable, um, but didn't hurt. Um, can't remember the exact length of time I was in there, maybe it was half an hour getting it done. Um, but anyway, the, they got the results back from that. Um, everything came through that, yes, I did have uh, MS. Obviously, looking back at the scan again, um, that came to the conclusion that it was uh, primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Now, obviously, this meant nothing to me at the time, but I've now since found out that Obviously, there's different types of multiple sclerosis, so there's primary progressive multiple sclerosis. It's hard just to get my lips around them words. Um, there's secondary progressive multiple sclerosis, and then there's um, the repetitive remittance multiple sclerosis. There may be others, but they're the, the main ones, I think. So basically, someone who can have, which affects a lot of people with multiple sclerosis, they have a repetitive remittance multiple sclerosis, which means that they are affected with um, the problems, um, mobility, whatever it is. But there's sort of, if you were to look out on a graph with repetitive remittance, what actually happens is you get um, your ups and downs, basically. So when it's up, you're actually having just say, a bad turn. That can be anything from um, a mobility issue, um, sight loss, um, sensations, anything like that. And it can be either really severe or not severe. And it can last for hours, days, weeks, months, years. And then you'll relapse to, uh, sorry, you're going to the remittance stage where it eases off and levels off and you're feeling okay again. And then at a later date, whether it's again, days, weeks, months, years, you'll have that um, bit where it peaks again and then again you can have the, the issues for days, weeks, months, years, whatever it is, and then you'll drop down again. That's my understanding of repetitive remittance. With primary, and what can then happen is after you've been repetitive remittance multiple sclerosis, that can then lead to secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So instead of you getting these peaks and troughs where you're up and down with your symptoms, when it hits secondary progressive, your symptoms, you've, you've been through all of repetitive remittance and then it starts to just gradually get worse. Um, with primary progressive, you don't have any of the repetitive remittance up and down on the graph symptoms, you just start and it gradually gets worse. So for me, it was primary progressive. Um, it's the least common form of MS, I believe. Um, as I say, the most common one is the repetitive remittance where you up and down on the troughs. Um, so mine is gradually going to get worse. Now, the way it actually affected me was, as I say, I had all this neuropathy problem that we were putting down to something else. Then it turned out, right, you've got primary progressive. That's why you've got the issues with your leg. That's the problem you've got. Um, my leg then developed um, foot drop. So a foot drop is basically um, trying to sort of demonstrate it with me hand. When you lift your leg, your foot sort of hangs. You haven't got the, the strength in the muscle that lifts your foot automatically, like, you know, as you would generally walk. So you develop foot, foot drop. <clears throat> now, with me, what was happening with the foot drop, although the foot drop itself wasn't a major issue, you, you know, you just sort of try and learn to lift your leg a little bit higher. Um, but what was happening was, I was tripping over me on foot. Um, so I did have um, quite a few stumbles and falls down onto my knees where I tripped over my foot. Um, I now have um, weakness right up my right side, so from me from me foot all the way up to the top of my arms, everything is weakened on my right side. Um, I currently walk with um, a walking stick or cane. Um, this is it helps walk, it helps me walk, and it helps 
maintain stability because without it, as I say, I can trip over my own foot. Um, and what I've noticed more so in the last sort of six to nine months is, it, it sounds straight, probably spatial awareness. Um, the only way I can explain it is if I'm walking into a room, I will catch the door, surround the door stanchel, um, or if I'm walking along a passageway, um, although I always sort of guide myself and sort of what they call sofa surfing, so I'm just sort of like um, using the furniture to walk around the house and stuff. But now what I find is that even though I'm feeling the, the, the surfaces, the door stencils, the door handles and things like that, I'm still sort of catching them as I'm walking past them. So I've put that down to uh, spatial awareness is the only way I can best describe that. Um, as far as um, medication or anything like that goes, um, there isn't any medication for uh, primary progressive multiple sclerosis, as far as I'm aware. I certainly haven't been offered any. Um, so there isn't a treatment for the MS side of it, but obviously they can treat the effects that I'm having. So obviously for... Um, <laughs> Ironically, there's nothing for the numbness and there's nothing for the foot drop. Um, but during the MRI, it, uh, MRI scan, it did actually point out as well where I've got cervical stenosis. Now, um, for those who don't know what that is, inside of my vertebrae uh, on the C-section, which is sort of top half of your neck, um, inside the vertebrae, my, each vertebrae bone is growing inside. Um, so what that's actually doing is that's nipping um, my spinal cord as well. So certain ways I'm over my head. I, I'm on medication for this for this pain, but prior to the medication, I was getting pain right across both shoulders and all the way down my right arm, right into uh, my thumb and my little finger. Ironically, my other fingers weren't affected. It's just the thumb and the little finger. But I was getting a stabbing pain constantly down there. I would have numbness in my right arm, pins and needles down into my hand and my little finger. Um, so that was affected. Um, I now take, um, obviously, gabapentin is a, is a good uh, medication for anything to do with nerves, uh, pain, things like that. Um, I was taking um, two on a morning, two on an afternoon, and two on an evening. That wasn't touching the sides, ironically, for the pain. So I um, spoke with the neurologist. I'm now taking three. So I'll take three on a morning, three on an afternoon, and three on an evening. That is working wonders. The pain is a lot easier to manage. Um, I'm managing to sleep on the night, which was another big major issue um, anybody who's got pain that stops you sleeping even the likes of toothache or earache it is the worst time because all you can think of is the pain and it just becomes worse and worse because you can't think of anything else other than the pain now that the medication's been upped on the gabapentin I'm, I can manage this pain and I'm getting the sleep which in turn is making me feel a lot better um, so as far as the MS again, obviously this foot drop and the limp that I was developing, I was limping because I was having to lift my leg higher to compensate for the foot drop. Um, I did actually go to, um, to get a, a shoe and a brace made. Um, now the, again, the problem I was having because I was having this swelling in my me, in me calf, um, they couldn't give us a, a regular type of shoe that they would normally use, which would have like an ankle brace that helped keep the foot up. So what it was, it was a, a it, it came as a pair, so I've got two shoes, but the right one was a shoe that had a brace, a metal brace that came up the back of my calf and then sort of strapped around the front. Um, now the reason for that was because of the swelling, it meant I could sort of loosen the strap as and when my me, me legs swollen. Um, I used this for a few months, um, but it was more of a hindrance than a help, to be honest. Um, and it also led to me developing, um, I can't remember what it's called now, I was getting an infection in, in my leg and front of my calf, 
where it was swelling, I was then getting an infection. Um, I kind of think what that's called now. But anyway, other things was happening. It, I don't know if you've seen the other video where I then had to go for a skin biopsy because they were worried about um, a, a blister thing that I had on me, me leg. They thought it was uh, cancerous. I did actually manage to record all of that biopsy, so I don't know if you've seen the video. Um, they did do the biopsy on that. They, they checked it. It turns out it's not skin cancer, but they've got a concern about something else that's going on there. So I have an appointment next week for that, for them to check that out. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing track I'm, again. So back to the MS kind of thing. So where I am at the moment is I think I was diagnosed, it must have been around about 2021 when I got the full diagnosis. So we're now in 2024. So where am I at at this point with the progression? Um, so I've went from being fine, quite active. Um, obviously, it's difficult because I have the CML running alongside and the stenosis running alongside. So things become blurred across what's actually causing what. Um, but where I am physically is, um, yes, I get out of breath very easy, whether that's the MS or whether it's the CML, I don't know. Um, I have restricted movement all over, but it's more in the right side of my body, and I have a lot more weakness in the right side of my body. Um, even just doing a, a simple thing, I'm gonna show you on this now, hopefully camera picks this up, no bother, but this is my left hand, obviously, Doing this with my left hand. Easy. Hopefully that picks that up, no problem. My right hand, I'll just get this camera back around again because we're drifting. So my right hand, <laughs> that, that's the same movement. It's, I can't do it. Um, doing the grip test where you're, you're testing on there. That's where I'm getting with that and that's where I get with that. So I've lost a lot of mobility in it's just my hand. I can actually still use my hand, although I've lost a lot of strength. I've lost a lot of grip strength in particular. So certain things, you know, just change. And it's strange because what you tend to find unconsciously, I now, when I'm going up the stairs, I use my left hand on the handrail I don't very rarely use the right hand. It seems as though I'm concentrating on lifting my right leg up all of the time. And I feel when I'm walking up the stairs, my whole right side is just hanging, limp. Really strange and, and strange one when you when you look back at it, but it's, it's an unconscious thing that happens. Your left side tends to take over. Um, when it comes to writing anything, I really struggle with writing. Luckily, in the job that I do, it's it, everything that I document is via a computer anyway, so that's that's a big help. Although I'm starting to struggle now with the keyboard on the right side. I've never been an amazing typist or anything like that. Um, I'm a hunt and peck typist, so I'm always looking at the screen and then looking at my keyboard and looking at the screen. Looking at the so I've never been a good typist anyway, but I find my right hand now is a bit more difficult. I tend to just use one or two fingers with my right hand now on the keyboard. Another thing that if I'm sitting with, um, just if I'm reading something on my screen, um, obviously I get confusion with the words and I'm struggling now to, to read stuff, I tend to have to read paragraphs or sentences over and over just for it to actually physically make sense. Um, so I do struggle a lot with that. Um, as I say, memory shot to bits. But Back to the computer thing, when I'm, if I'm sitting with uh, my hand just on the mouse, um, if I'm reading something on the screen, I'm just sitting with my hand on the mouse, I accidentally keep clicking the mouse. It, it's like, a, again, something I'm not intending to do, but it clicks the mouse. It can be annoying at times, because depending on where the pointer is, I can skip up a page and not realize. But so things are, so it's changing up a little bit. So when I'm using the computer, I now sit with my hand completely off the mouse if I'm reading something um, because of that. And I've noticed more lately over the last few months that when I do take my hand off, it then just rests funny on my lap. Um, 
it's really weird to try and explain it because it's something that you don't actually notice at the time because you're doing everything unconsciously but it does actually come about um, but as again back to the weakness as I say the, the left hand side seems to be taking over and becoming more prominent um, just simple things you go to pick a cup up I'm right handed I would always pick the cup up with my right hand now I automatically pick it up with my left hand I shouldn't really because I should be trying and like keep your brain engaged on the right side but again I do try that but unconsciously you just now I'm using my left hand more for a lot of things um, which is really strange um, so what else can I talk about that I've got um, symptom wise as I say I'm not sure whether it's the CML, whether it's the MS, whether it's the cervical stenosis, whether it's me medication, everything is just in a big cycle and a big blur. So I'm just, while I can live in life and moving as much as I can, doing whatever I want to do. Um, as I say, you'll often see these videos where we're just down the beach and things like that. Um, I'm working today. I'm down the beach. I'm working. I've got my laptop with us. Um, I'm, you know, doing bits of space on there. Just took this break out just to try and catch up on this video. It's one that I wanted to do. Um, just discussing MS. So anyone who's actually just been diagnosed with MS or has been living with MS um, for you know any length of time, I'd be really interested in getting your comments, uh, how you're feeling, how you're managing, um, what your change is, um, in particular if you've got primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Um, I've watched a few other different uh, YouTube channels and seen a few. Um, and obviously I look to the future a little bit and I can say that at some point I will be in a wheelchair. Um, I do actually have a mobility scooter because before the MS and before the CML I used to be really active. Um, I love photography, I was always out. Um, I'd get up, nothing better than getting up on a weekend, five o'clock in the morning, go out and do some street photography. Um, of just empty barren streets in the middle of city centres or out doing landscape photography, things like that. Um, but obviously I can't walk any of them distances. Walk sort of 20, 30 yards using a stick and I'm struggling. Um, when I am walking, even with the stick, I get a, a really horrible burning sensation in both feet. But it's strange because I can't feel the feet. So the only way to describe it, and I know I mentioned it in one of my other videos, it's like walking on bloody stumps, um, as though my feet have been cut off and I'm just walking on the bare stumps, is the only way to describe the kind of pain that you get. Um, so when I was struggling to, to walk, obviously we've got the dogs, they still need exercise, so it was to get them out, especially with Bracken. Um, obviously he's a, he's a bigger dog and he's a copper spaniel and he needs exercise. So I got this mobility scooter and I was using the scooter quite a bit. Um, I can get it in the van. I used to be able to get it in the back of the car. And we would take it to the park and I could literally ride around the park on the scooter with Bracken on his lead and he was getting that kind of exercise. Um, but then the scooter was becoming, the more that I was losing the strength in the right side, the scooter was becoming a bit of a hindrance, getting it in and out of the vehicle just because of its weight and size. So that's currently just stuck in the in the hallway in the in the house. Um, but it was a good thing to get, and I know I will need it again in the future. Obviously, now with Bracken's exercise, it's great that he's into using the the ball throw because I can literally. I mean, I'm just going to flip you around here. You can see how close I am. So we've got. That's Bracken just lying in the van um, and just spin you around here a little bit. That's how close I am to this beach. So we've got the water coming in. Absolutely stunning. So basically, um, I literally just have to walk 20 yards on the beach. Um, I've got the, the, th the ball toss thing for Bracken. I can stand still. He can run 20 miles, I can walk 20 feet, he's getting the exercise, I'm not in pain. It's a comfortable balance that we've got going on at the moment. Um, 
So yeah, obviously I still try and do as much as I can. I try and stay as active as I can. If you've seen the other videos, I've just tried paddle boarding for the first time. Um, I will be doing that again. It is a real struggle getting in and out of a wetsuit. I used to do this all the time. I used to be a keen scuba diver. In and out of wetsuits was never a problem. Now it is a problem, but it's down to mobility as well. Don't get me wrong. I know I could, lose, uh, could do with losing a couple of ounces or a few stone, potentially. <laughs> um, so, I, you know, I've got these mobility problems where I'm still trying to do what I can when I can. And as I say, the paddle boarding was one thing that I really wanted to try. I failed miserably at it, but I am going to try again. Um, and we're planning another trip away um, next week, just for a few days, but we're going to head up to Scotland, um, try and get up like the mid Highland area, so sort of Loch Lomond up there, maybe Glencoe and stuff like that. I'm going to take the paddle board with me, and if we get a good park spot where I can get the paddle board out, maybe it's got onto one of the locks, I'll definitely be giving that a go again because I thoroughly enjoyed it, even though I was uh, useless at it and I was really ill after that. Um, again, it's another video. So, anyway, this multiple sclerosis thing, hopefully, what I've been talking about is maybe it's opened up a little bit conversation for someone else. As I say, leave your comments we love it when we get comments um, thank you to everyone that's commented in the past on our other videos um, but yeah tell us what your ms symptoms are what your problems are um, i'd love to hear about it if you've got your own youtube channel where you're discussing things like this point us in that direction and we'll take a look at that and uh, it's it's great to try and help each other um, one thing i will say with ms if you've just been diagnosed don't panic um, because you hear a lot of horror stories and there's not many people who give the good stories yet. Yeah, unfortunately, it's one of them things that you've got. You're going to have it all of the time. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have good days. Um, while you've got the good days, live all your good days. It's as simple as that. Um, you try and stay positive. I, I say this all the time. If you're positive, it breeds positivity in others explain everything to your family so if you do have a problem they know what you're talking about and they'll know what to expect things like that um, try and be open with people the more people that know your problems the less problems you'll actually have is one of the things that i sort of learned by um, like I say everybody at work know the problems that i've got um, they see me walking with a walking stick but it's fine, it's not, not an issue for me. Um, I know ultimately in years to come, how long that might be, I don't know. It may be months, years, 10 years, I've, I've no idea. Yes, I've got progressive and it is gonna progressively get worse, but while it's in the state that it is, I'm gonna carry on trying to do as much as I can. And it would be great if everybody can live by the same sort of chapters. Um, do it while you can. So anyway, I'm starting to waffle now. Um, hopefully the video has been a little bit of a help and a little bit of an insight. Um, as again, hear us with the comments, like and subscribe. Um, I'm hoping that everybody's liking the stuff that we're putting out on the channel. Um, if you'd like us to try anything, give us a shout, leave it in the comments and we will catch you on the next one. So see you soon. Bye.